And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets. Now, things are a little bit different now. And, but you know what he's saying. That they may be seen by men. It's kind of like those guys, you can't get them to do nothing until they get a microphone in their hand. All of a sudden, you can't get them to stop. <laughs> Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, he's singling people out. And it's up to us that that would apply to us. It's not that scripture aligns with us, but God help me to align with scripture. Let this, let him be, let this be for me. When you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. We'll go to Psalms 91 now, but we won't. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain. Listen to me, folks. I, I am not just preaching for preachers. I'm going to help some of you, and this is going to help you. Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, don't, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need uh, before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And everybody said amen. Place your Bibles down. Let's, let's go before the Lord. Let's pray right now. Now, be specific. God, I want an impartation tonight. I want to learn from your word. I want the presence, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the man of God to speak into me that I may grow today. Help us, Lord, tonight. Plant the seed in the fertile soil of our souls of your Word that we might not sin against you. Help us, prepare us, get us ready, Lord God, that we could truly be the people of God who not only pray, but know how to pray. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to give you a few quotes from one of the greatest writers on, on prayer that's not in the Bible, and that's uh, E.M. Bounds. And then you're going to get one from this other guy I know. Talking to men for God is a great thing, but talking to God for men is greater still. Piggybacking off that, he will never talk well and with real success to men for God who has not first learned well how to talk to God for men. Our praying needs to be pressed and pursued with an energy that never tires, a persistency which will not be denied, and a courage that never fails. And the honesty, and if you go and study out Brother Bounds, I've got a few of his books in my library. Um, it behooves some people to go in there and maybe peruse through some of those pages. Spiritual work is taxing work. That, why not? That, that's why many don't do it. It's hard to shut your mind down from all the busyness of the day the habits and the hobbies that we develop that seem to press on us. So he says spiritual work is taxing work, and men are loath to do it. Praying, true praying, costs an outlay of serious attention and of time, which flesh and blood do not relish. I think that he's been reading uh, Paul there a little bit when he wrote that. I stole off of this. I'm going to read Ian Bounds, and then I'm going to read you something I wrote. 
The word of God is the fulcrum upon which the lever of prayer is placed and by which things are mightily moved. <laughs> this is me, not revelatory, but I hope I can give you a word picture that would help you with prayer. Prayer is the unseen lever by which the believers pry the miraculous out of their faith and into their lives. And then finishing with a great, greater writer, obviously, than myself. The story of every great Christian achievement is the history of answered prayer. <laughs> too many folks, too many Christians, are settling for having a form of power in here without having any power out there. And it's really out there where we need this thing. Amen? So if you give me a few minutes tonight, in the honesty and sometimes the painfulness of some things that I'm going to say, because can we be Christians without a prayer life? It's evident and very sad that a large number of believers never try to learn or to improve their prayer life. Many are still praying at the same level and depth they did when they first walked into the church, got baptized full of the Holy Ghost, and just kept on at the level that they're at. But metaphorically, when your child is two, you don't mind him or her communicating simplistically with you. They say the same thing over. They learn a word, they say it because it gets a reaction out of you. You know, they give me, hold me, change me. Of course, they mean a different change than... <laughs> because when you're 23, or your child's 23, you kind of expect them to not only be able to carry on a mature and multifaceted conversation, you expect them to be able to change some things. If you're here and you still haven't matured beyond the baby talk and you're still praying, give me, hold me, change me, little tongue in cheek here, there's a nursery in the back for you. Why should our Christianity or our Christian life be any different than our physical life? Other than Nehemiah, is anybody else in here wearing diapers? Thank God. Of course, in all honesty, as we get older, I guess it depends on what happens to you. <laughs> should we not be maturing? Look, I'm not calling anybody out. I, I, I'm calling us out because the last thing I want you to do is get all this teaching and all this preaching in the schoolhouse of the Lord and go out there and fail or stand before the Lord and be found empty or wanting. Some of us need to examine ourselves very closely. These are not questions to avoid. Has your Christianity improved? Are you closer to the Lord? I, I, I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm not trying to sound successful because I'm actually not going to talk about me. Again, this morning, having been up and dealing with stuff late again into the night to try to allow there to be peace in my home so that my two wonderful ladies could sleep. I had to deal with the situation in the wee hours of the night, and I finally got to bed. And I, I don't know if I just got to bed and I laid down, and I must have dozed off because the next thing I know, I, I hear this sound that wakes me up. And I look over, and the other side of the bed is empty. And it is, to me, the most wonderful sound in my home. And it is the sound of a lady of God reaching and touching his throne. Has your prayer life matured? Nobody would, you know, I, I, that's not bragging on, on Sister Crow. I, I, if you're a pastor's wife, should not that be the order of the day? And anything less would be an affront. 
Are you learning to more effectively communicate with God? Shouldn't that be something that we do? When you come in here, do you demand and cry for care? I hear someone told me the other day that someone said, well, I wasn't getting fed over there. Wait a minute, when you come over as, and, and on the auspices of being a leader, aren't you supposed to be doing the feeding? Uh, those are words of a baby. Well, are you a consistent contributor? Now, for those of you who've just been down around here a short time or making your way back, listen, you're okay. I get that. But let me give you some advice. Let me give you some advice, young people. Let me give you some advice, new Christians or returning Christians. Get close to those people that are really living it. Tie yourself to them. Walk in here at prayer time. Get close to those folks that are here. Look at the church cleaning list. Look and see who's doing the things of the church. Get close to those folks. See, watch those folks that are worshiping and get close to those people. Those are attributes that should develop in a mature Christian, and they do so because you're around someone that's teaching you. There's nothing worse than that Monday morning or armchair quarterback that watches everything on Sunday and on Monday sells everything what should be done, but they weren't doing any of it. Right? Get close to those folks. Those will be your praying people. Not your perfect people, but your praying people. So let me ask, is there anyone here got anybody trying to learn to pray like you? I ask that because there was something about the way Jesus prayed and his ability to pray that intrigued the disciples to want to know what he knew about prayer. So they asked him. They asked him. That, that's what the Lord, the, the, the matrix or the formula of the Lord's prayer is there. It's an answer. If you, if you want to know if your prayer life is matured, one way to know is if when others hear you pray, they want to be around you to learn. I'm not talking about those people that try to impress with long, eloquent, wordy, fancy language. Or Well, I'm just talking about when someone sees your Christian life, hears you pray, and they recognize that there is a connection with God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I say that because, honestly, I'm so thankful for the examples that I had in my life when I first came to church to help me learn how to pray, to learn how to push through carnality. That's, that's a skill that you can never lay down. You've got to keep it. How, how, how to make prayer a priority is, is a, a discipline. Without discipline, you can't be a disciple. Learn how to shut down all the other voices, the other opinions that say, get up and do this and go to, to where prayer isn't really a part of your life except for when you walk into the church and you squeeze it in a few moments before worship starts. Learning how to shut out, like we read in the Old Testament, the storms, the lightning and the thunder, to get to that place, that secret place, to hear that still small voice. Amen? I remember all the times when, when you know, I first got into church, and in all honesty, it kind of seems kind of foreign. I, I jump in the car, and I, I'm, I'm the new guy joining the crowd, and, you know, uh, where are we going? Oh, we're going to go to church to pray. When you're new, you're like, what? How long is that going to take? Man, I do that before I eat. What's the matter with you guys? And then we would go to church, and there would be, you know, Four guys there, and then somebody else would pull in, and we'd have a group of men just at the church. And they'd be praying. I remember times praying, and what, what's interesting is that part of that group at the time, we were just men in the church, but I look back now, every one of those men are pastoring churches right now. They're pastoring churches right now. 
It, it didn't dawn on me then as we're spending time praying around those. Remember the 70s, 80s, that bright blue cloth that they had on, the, on those pews with the wood? Never forget them. They're all over the country. Let me give them bad boys away now and go to chairs. I never forget that. I, I, I'll never forget that time going in and pr praying with Mike Fox, who's gone on to be with the Lord now, and Steve McCollum and Marty, and here I am, all new guys just praying, showing up to pray. I'll never forget the first time I'm in a car with Brother Monroe, and we've got uh, two girls in the back. What are we going to go do? I'm fresh out of the world. You know what we did? Matt said, let's go pray. Oh, you out of your mind? <laughs> I'm brand new. I'm brand new. I don't know any better. But thank God I got next to someone who did. There's always going to be those that run to the carnival. Thank God those that run to being a Christian. And it begins with prayer. It's a discipline. It's a lifestyle. It's a developed desire. It's a say, you know what? I can't really be one without it. There ought to be something in the spirit, something in our knowledge, something in our understanding that when you walk into a prayer time, you turn yourself around to eliminate distractions and focus on God because you can't just sit there and hem high your way through prayer. That's not prayer. You ever seen people sit at a table and not talk to each other? That's what you're doing here. You know, if Jesus really wanted to be as spiritual as we are today, he, he could have started off with like, you know what, when you want to know how to pray, start praying for world peace. Right? Let's pray for economic stability. It sounds noble, right? Jesus knew that many of the things that we spend a significant amount of time asking for and, can I say, begging for would be resolved if we would simply get a revelation of putting God first and praying. I won't read the whole thing, but you should have highlighted or memorized 2 Corinthians seven fourteen. If my people. If my people. You see, if you need provision, Get a revelation of God as your provider. If you need healing, get a revelation of God as your healer. Need peace, get a revelation of God as your peace speaker. Need protection, get a revelation of God as the one who will never leave nor forsake you, right? You need a revelation, but I think our prayers often reveal a lack of revelation. Our lives, our outlook, our perspective, our priorities, our problems would dramatically change. If we had a revelation, I know you some have been around a church a long time, but your prayerlessness reveals a lack of revelation. You can't tell me that being around Jesus makes you want to be around Jesus less. Or being around Jesus is not important. Or just simply being a Christian and setting a bad example is okay. Lack of revelation leads to a lack of preparation. Lack of preparation leads to a lack of separation. A lack of separation leads to a lack of participation. And a lack of participation leads to a lack of sanctification. And no sanctification then leads to a lack of an experience with God. If your experience with God is something you talk about that happened 10 years ago, not today, You see, because you can be around the church and not really experience Jesus. But you can't be around Jesus and not experience a revelation. Our narrow revelation of God, our narrow view of God, leads to a shallow experience with God. Does this make sense? And I want to sort of, and I'll be honest, if I don't get through all this tonight, that's fine. We'll, we'll get through it. Prayerlessness is akin to godlessness. Our needs, and you need to hear this, because this is twofold. Our needs 
become smaller when we view them through the lens of God's view of what the world needs. Selfishness is prayerlessness. Maybe that's why some of us never really pray for others. We are so self-centered that we want to remain the focus of our attention. It's always about what am I going to get? What do I get out of the deal? Jesus instructs us to pray for our world to be set right. You know, he doesn't say sing and criticize or rail that the world will be right. He said pray without ceasing. Pray when you pray. So I challenge you that after this lesson, during your, hopefully, next prayer time, listen, listen to me. This is, this is personal. I'm not just trying to run through this and get emotional and get this message done. And the next time you pray, ask God. Maybe it's again or again or the first time in a long time to reveal himself in your life. God, I want to see you. I want to restore the newness of that relationship. I, I want my family to experience you. I want my children to know you. I, I, want, I want my marriage influenced by your presence. I, I want my life, my job, my checkbook, my hobbies, my habits to be influenced and impacted by my relationship with you. And so in, in all, all this stuff that's going on, the disciples asked him how to pray. So in order for you to become the people of God, we must also be people prone to prayer and fasting. And in, in, in verse I said, in this manner, therefore pray. Some might argue that if our focus is the actual prayer, then this first phrase is not part of it. But it is important and meaningful part of the whole because the original language contains an emphatic form of the word you and a present tense form of the word pray. You take that together, they indicate this is actually an emphatic instruction from Jesus to the disciples. You pray. You pray. That's basically translated what that means. Prayer is a must. Prayer is a must. It, it's not just a, listen, it's not just a must to be a Christian, but the moment you stand up and you're anything in the church, you have, and I hate to use the word title, but you hold any form of title. Prayer time is a call to arms. And if you're not there, you're unarmed. You're not fit for battle. Get in the back. Are you all right with that? Okay. So therefore, by extension, if we are to be his disciples today, it is applicable to us to, uh, as followers of Christ that we too must be regularly engaged in, in the act of prayer. Let me tell you what prayer is not. Prayer is not just a bunch of babbling tongues and indiscernible phrases that you just blurt out because it's prayer. In Luke 18, he, won, he said, and he spake a parable in them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Faint means to be weak. It means to be weary. Prayer is an attribute of those strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Prayerless people are neither strong in the Lord they don't have that attribute, and they don't have the power of his might. A lot of things they do is them. Make sense? Ephesians tells us in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 10 through 12, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high play. If you're not praying, you're unarmed, you're unprotected. You're not, you're not, you're not fit. The Bible talks, and I'm not going to get into that tonight because another message I'm working on, talks about, go read it and note that you'll find it. It says fit men. Fit men. Go understand what that means, man. We're going to get to that. Here, girls, this is for you. Some of you over here, some of you over here. Listen, when looking, because you understand, by default, the man is the head of the house. 
If you're going to look to find one, find one that really prays. Fine. Even if you're shocker and says, oh, my God, I've never heard you pray. anybody pray like that. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> this is how I pray. Find one that can put his phone down during prayer time. Find one that can put it down daily. Find one that can put down all the social media. Find one that refuses to miss prayer because he's strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That phrase, in this manner, that Jesus used implies that this is a model or outline of the types of prayers that should be prayed, rather than just a creed or mantra to be repeated over. The Lord's Prayer is not something to be repeated. It's not what it is. Some people do that because they've never, you know, delved into what's really being said and what's Jesus really teaching here, because he's already said vain repetition. He doesn't want that. Because we're warned against that, the same words over and over and over again. You can't sit there just repeating it. Even sitting there, let me help you. The, at the name of Jesus, yeah, do all in the name of Jesus. But you just can't sit there going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's not prayer. That's like me standing in the room, looking across at Brother Young, go, Joe, 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 Joe. I can't. I, I, I hate to break, I hate to, to Jesus to play undercover boss and come walk in and deal with some of us. You ought to see some of us be so particular about how things need to be done, even at the church. Well, bless God, it's got to be this way. I get that. If we're going to do the finances this way, if we're going to do music this way, if we're going to do, it's going to be this way. And then we turn around and, oh, wait a minute, you ain't going to tell me how to pray, what well, Jesus did. Don't we get in the way of God a lot? Oh, we start, we've been in church five minutes. We've been in church any like the time. So you ain't going to tell me how to be spiritual. You're right, I'm not. And you're never going to be spiritual. This is a model. This is an outline. We're warned against vain repetitious and mindless uttering of the same words over and over. I, I get it. You get enthusiastic. I've seen people get so excited and run and go, mom, mom, mom. But at some point, you better say what you got to say. Dad, dad, dad. Oh, okay, calm down. What? Can I get an amen? amen. Saying hallelujah 50 times, it ain't prayer. Prayer is a petition, it is a request, it is conversing with the Almighty. Have some respect. He's not an idiot where you got to say his name 500 times. Make your petition known. When ye pray, give him your petition. Matthew 6 and 7. Go look at it. It's what it says. As the heathen do, for they think that should be heard for the message. Listen, we're not. We're, look, you don't sound spiritual by saying something really loud for us all to hear 50 times. Even Paul said, listen, I would in the church, I would rather speak just a few words and understand. I can go there if you need, but I'm already going to go long tonight. And if I not teach you, I'll split this up. He says, I'm glad I speak with tongues more than you, but in the church. But in the church. There's so much, I'm, I'm, forgive me, but there's so much to learn that sometimes I take it for granted. Some people, you, you know, but you don't. You've got to learn these things. Amen? So Jesus gives us an outline of how to pray. This outline is the kind of praying that we should be engaged in, knowing that we should examine it and seek to understand the principles contained within it. The prayer in the New King James Version is 66 words, and it's broken down into distinct parts. It begins with an address that is an identification of the one being prayed to. This is quickly followed by a three God-centered petitions. There's three petitions that are focused solely on God. You'll see them, and they are the your statements. Are you following me in your Bible? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. His name's hallowed, not mine. Let me help you get over your bad self. 
Your kingdom come, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. I tell you, from the cry, I just ain't called to do what they're called to do. You've missed prayer. This is Christianity. This is Christian kindergarten. My wife's a teacher. Sometimes you've got to repeat the class. I don't care how long you've been in church. Hallowed be your name. You drive it around town. I can't think I'm some bitch. I'm the pastor, bless God. That doesn't disqualify the fact that I still got to pray. Bless God, I'm the pastor. I don't need to pray around here. Wouldn't that be a joke? Bless his kingdom. Wait a minute, I'm the pastor around here. What? Maybe the reason you didn't or you're not getting anything done is because He's like, I'm not going to bless something until it's what I want to bless. Your, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Sometimes we're stagnated and stalled out because it's waiting for us to get back to this first element of prayer. God, you have to understand something. God wants to bless people. God wants to anoint people. God wants to use people. What's stopping all that? A lack of understanding. God has no respect for a pearl. That guy just anointed to do more than me. Saul was not anointed more than David. David was just more submitted than Saul. David was willing to give anything up. Saul's like, uh-uh, man, I'm going to get all of y'all. going to know who I am. Got my armor. Look at all my stuff. David walked in all the other with a slingshot. Sometimes... We get too big for God to use. That's why prayer is so important. Let me tell you something. The greatest place, even in, let me tell you something. Leaders, I'm going to tell my leaders something. I'm going to tell you something. Be the first ones in this altar. You know, even if you ain't got nothing to repent of, come up and repent anyway. Because if you're not going to lead by example, you can't lead. Go show and let people know, oh, I believe in prayer. I believe in prayer. Get around someone that's going to show you how to pray. I'm so thankful that the people, the church and the people taught me. My God, as soon as the altar call was given, brother, you better get that altar. You ain't going to have a spot. I, I, I hate to admit there's a carnal side to this. That was my seat in the church. I kind of brought a little worldliness in too. A couple of times I walked in Sunday to a sinner and said, no, you got to move. I didn't quite understand preferring your brother yet. Now, when it taught me that verse, so I was like, you're going to go outside. <laughs> go give me, that's my seat. Because I want the pastor to call on me because I'm going to go move the projector. Some of you don't know what the projector is. Some of you do. Got to go over there. I'm playing it. Turn off it. <laughs> now we got all this fancy stuff that does nothing but give me and Brother Ezekiel headaches. And Eric. Listen, God-oriented requests are then followed by the three petitions that have been given. These are the us statements. Are you hearing me? So we're going we're gonna to go into the next three. First, first, the first three are, how will be your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done. You ready? Are you, is that good? Listen. Here are the us statements. This is after God's first in everything. You said we say everything. Now, when you get God in the right perspective, because we get this in reverse, because this is how we normally pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Give it to me now, God. What? I know I just walked in here and then said, praise the Lord. I ain't said two words. You know, I'm fault my husband on the way here. But y'all, God, you better just help me bless right now. Y'all, God, forgive me, God. Now, don't expect me to forgive nobody around me, but forgive me. Come on. All right, in all seriousness, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. And do not lead us into temptation. It is formally, you know, called the doxology or a statement of praise. Doxology is a 
liturgical formula of praise God. Okay? That's all it is. It's a neat word to use. It means really simple. What you should notice first is that the overall structure, because when most folks pray, like I said, we tend to focus on us. But when you first get down to pray, we should focus on him. I, I remember when I finally got that. I remember when I finally, you have to understand, there are some times I almost feel like that kid rushing in and going, dad, 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 dad. And I would rush in and I want to talk to him. Wait. I would just say, spend time exalting, lifting him up, and, and, and making sure I put myself in the right place. And he was elevated. I literally stopped everything. And I, I did what was right and not what I felt. Is that okay to say it that way? Because I believe I will be safe in speaking for most of us that most of our prayers are us-oriented, they're us-centered. We come in, oh, God, I need this. I need a job. I need money. I need, oh, bless God, help, help me get my way around here. But the prayer that Jesus demonstrated is mostly God-centered and God-oriented. God has the preeminence. That's, that's when you're finally getting in the right position. Titles mean nothing if you're not in the right position with God. If nobody's following, you're not leading. Let that sink in. So it begins by addressing first God who by virtue of being heaven is above all, and then ends by declaring the absolute sovereignty of God. Understanding sovereignty means no matter what happens, he's God. Thank you. I've, I've seen it happen. I've seen some of the best stalwart saints come in and going through something, and they, they question the sovereignty of God. And I'm like, well, well, you haven't been in prayer, and the next time you go to prayer, you might hit a brass ceiling because until you go through and put God back, no matter though he slay me, yet will I. Sandwich in the middle are six petitions, three of which pertain to God's plans and purpose rather than ours, and it's those three that are first addressed. The us-centered part of the prayer is secondary, Correct. A person should not pray primarily in order to receive goods and services from God, but rather to render services to God. Write that down. Luke 19 and 8. Here's Zacchaeus face to face with Jesus. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from men, by any man of false sake, I restored him. But the, where did that come from? When you truly get in the presence of God, you're looking to what you can give, fix, restore, help, and serve. When you are in that place where you're walking around and it's all about you, a real encounter leads to a real prayer. And real prayer begins by serving God, not my will but thy will be done. It is so important to have an altar where you say day in and day out, not my will, but thy will be done. What can I do today, God? How can I serve today? Not bless God. Move out of the way, folks. Let me tell you how we're going to get this done. That's what we do. We all do that. We jump up in the morning and we go running off, hell bent to get done what we need to get done. And we wonder why. Well, I don't feel God in my life. I, got, I don't even hear his words not speaking to me anymore. Everything's down in my church. I wouldn't, like to, I wouldn't like somebody whose house I went to and we never talked. It's awkward. You ever sat in a waiting room with a bunch of people and no one's talking? Look, when I go to the restaurant, I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to make a comment. Hey, how you doing? I go see Costco. What's up? Hey, how you doing? Can you Some of you come to church and you treat God like that. Oh my God, what's he doing here? You're singing about someone you won't even invite to the place.
Can we say, oh me, or amen? When, 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 when Saul had that encounter with Jesus, I'm Jesus who now persecutes. Wait a minute. I mean, he was thrown to the ground. Some of you, have, I, I've never seen in my years here, you've seen you come up and kneel at an altar. This dude was thrown down to the ground. You know what he said? And he trembling in his thoughts said, Lord, what thou have me to do? You ever wonder why God's not giving you instructions? Find yourself in a place where I got no problem coming to this altar. I've got no problem walking up and just putting myself in the place. God, what will you have me to do? I've heard people say, I'd do it if I knew God wanted me to. You'd know God would want you to if you get into prayer. Real prayer, not your prayer. His prayer. Hallowed be, be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will. See, the secular church it doesn't do that anymore. Come in, come as you are. God has to accept you just like you are. No, he don't. You didn't read your Bible. He may. But before you think you're going to strong arm Jesus into saving you, you might want to read his book. Oh, you're telling me if I just walk into your house in the middle of the night and get your fridge, you'll be all cool about that? And you know me. We got a whole world out there that don't know him. He says, look, he's going to say, I never knew you. You have to go, well, I did so many things for Jesus. Like, you did? I don't know you. See, what I'm trying to do here is it's this simple, th this, this one, in, in all honesty, the, the main tenet that makes you a Christian is prayer. Reading the word, which one's more important? I don't know, which is more important, breathing in or breathing out? And he said, what would you have me do? Rise and go to the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. See, that's another thing. God will tell you, but then you ain't going to let God send someone to tell you. Well, I'll get, he's going to give you pastors after your own heart. Well, I don't like him. I'm not going to submit myself to him. He's not a very good husband. <laughs> Prayer is not first and foremost, an exercise to meet a disciple's needs, to fulfill the disciple's desires or solve the disciple's problems. Rather, it begins with a desire to see the name of the Lord exalted. When you get in prayer and you're seeking to exalt the Lord, nothing, nothing is beneath you to do. To see his kingdom advance, to see his will perform. Let me tell you something. One of the most important things you can ever do, you want to find the will of God for you, for your family, for your church, you're going to find it in prayer. If, if things are trucking along and things are moving and things are going and when you get involved, all of a sudden everything piles up in a wreck, you might want to check yourself. Make sense? Everything else, when, when, it comes, when it comes to prayer, is secondary to making sure that we exalt the Lord. That mindset, that mindset comes from true interaction with a holy, sovereign God. I can't tell you how many times that someone's literally done me wrong, and I've got social right, indignant right, I'm just going to take the right to go put them in their place and I go get in prayer. I know none of y'all experience that. Only pastor does. And I got in there. I said, you know, God, I'm just going to leave that in your hands. You're sovereign. Oh, God, I never want to be the person that, that someone has to go, oh, you're sovereign, God. I don't want to deal with them. You do. Oh, God, let me walk with you. Let me know. Mm -hmm. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father is, a, is Greek for the Aramaic Abba. This is important because this, this is important. Hear me, this is, this is intimacy. Understand who God is to you. It is similar to the term daddy in English. Now, when you were too big to have a daddy in your life, but 
I tell you what, at 55, I'd love to hear my dad. It uses, its use highlights, when it says Abba, it, it, it highlights the centrality of relationship as the fountain of prayers. What, what am I saying? There is nothing to me that would be more greater than to sit down and have a conversation with my dad. Been gone since I was a teenager, but I tell you right now, what a meeting that would be. It should be that way every time you come to the house of God. I'm going to go sit with Dad. I'm going to go hear from my Dad. I'm going to talk to the one who gave his life for me. The one who loves me. You better believe how it be. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Why? I don't want to strive with my dad. I don't want to bring division in my dad's house. Coming from the teenager that did. Oh, that I could make that up. Oh, that I could fix that. You, I, I'm not going to come in the house of God to cause the division. I come in here find the will of God. What do you want us to do, Lord? You're not a faceless petitioner tonight. You're not presenting a plea to some distant monarch or oligarch. He knows who you are. We're not appealing to the unjust judge that was used as an analogy for us. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He desires. We're not some unknown person coming out of nowhere to ask to speak. Can you imagine how many know that he knows our down sittings and our uprisings? How many knows that I'm pretty sure he knows what time church is for us around here. I wonder if he's okay with coming late. I, I, I wonder if he's like, ah, not today. If he's the one we petition for these things, if he decided with the idea, not my job. Imagine if God treated us like our attitudes and our actions come across sometimes. Well, bless God, I did that last week. I got to do it again. I'm pretty sure he could say, that's what I've been doing. Come on, I've been doing that for you for 50 years. You want him to stop? Why would you? Luke 15, beginning at verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before you, you need to listen here. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. Anybody ever messed up before? Do you realize what he's doing? I'm a son, by, but my actions do not equate to being a son. I'm coming to serve. Listen. Listen carefully here. And because he comes into the house, he comes back to the Lord, comes to his father with the right attitude to serve. See, when you come to serve, his father, after he sees the heart, the mindset, the attitude, and the action, that desire to serve, the prodigal is then restored to that of a son. Oh, did you, did you, did you see that? I hope that helped. Oh, God. That blessed me. You see, the world wants fatherless children. Because fatherless children are easy to manipulate. When you don't have a pastor, when you don't have the authority, the levels in the church, 
it, it deals with this. Listen, it's Hebrews 12, 7 through 9. If ye endure chastening, you know, Sister Carol, the last thing I would ever want to do is chasten you. I don't want to, my wife will hurt me. I don't want to chasten her. But she said, I don't want to chasten you guys. But if you guys are wrong and you're doing something wrong, you have to be as open to being helped as I am. Because if you're beyond chastening, let's, let's read this now. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Sonship comes with submission to authority. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? You see, that lone wolf, bless God, yeah, little whippersnip. Those who are not submissive to any authorities are fatherless. Listen. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. It's in the Bible. Your attitude dictates whether you're a son or a slave. It's Bible, folks. Not to hurt, but you ever wonder why God's not meeting those needs? You ever wonder why God's not jumping in like a dad? Because your attitude's wrong. Give me what belongs to me. I'm out. This is a wake up call. When you get to the place where you can't take correction, where you don't need a pastor, the word of God says you're without a father and you're like the prodigal that's sitting in a pig pen. Paul told the church in Rome in, in, in chapter 8, verses 13, 15, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. You serve your own flesh, you're going to die forever. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You turn from a slave to a son. But it's all in what you choose to serve. It's your attitude. It's your mentality. So you have to understand, when you come with the mentality, the attitude of a son in the father's house, there's no problem with coming to an altar. There's no problem with getting down in prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. How you walk into the house really shows how you feel about the Father? Are you hearing me? For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Right? But listen, he goes on. For because as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, there it is. Ah, the Father, Daddy. 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 Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? When you stop and you think about all those fatherless and adopted kids that we have coming here and people that have lost, oh, when you walk in here, yeah. Once a slave to sin, once lost and in the pig pen, we become the sons and daughter, daughters of Almighty God, and we can come in here with the right attitude. God, I love you. I need you. Oh, I'm so thankful for you. How, how many times as we all as teenagers get mad? I hate my mom. I hate my dad. It's going to happen. It's called the pride of life. That's why they have that little thing. Quick, hire a teenager while they know everything. <laughs> That's a nerve over there. Yeah, yeah, you, stop and think about it. We can't come walking in here as embittered little teenagers think we know everything because we've been around a long time and we got God all cornered in the market. He's like, wait a minute. He can give a conversation to you like he did Joe. Where were you? And all of a sudden things get put in perspective. I, I, you know, I, don't, don't get me wrong when I say this because I'll be honest with you. I, I can't say enough about this young lady over here and how proud I am of her. But there's a few moments in time, I, hey, hold, 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 hold on. You have to understand something. I've been there. You've never been here. Hold on. Look at your mom with reverence. And hold, hold, hold on. Because we see the little minor imperfections, you know. Maybe mom didn't, you know, 
do this or do that, and they got up into your skin. Hold up. She's been 25. You've never been in her 18 any of y'all's business. <laughs> Homie wants to stay alive when I get home. <laughs> See, because we have a good father. We have a good, good father. And if we walk right and we act, how endearing and wonderful is the house of God when we have the right attitude here. Remember, you know, I don't know how you are when I first started coming to church. I couldn't wait to get there. I love being there. Can I tell you something? I, everybody was perfect. Y'all are awesome. And then after being around the house a little while, <laughs> but then go and find yourself homeless for a little while and getting brought back into the house oh man ain't it nothing to me I love you I don't care about any of that let me help you let me pay. let me make up the deal let me help that because that's the attitude that the father would want you to have oh let's thank the Lord for that right now let's thank God right now he's a good good Father, you better believe I want to talk to him when I come into the house. You better believe I want to exalt him and lift him up. He makes me better for you and you better for me and all of us better for him. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, we're the sons and daughters. We're his children. We may have spats and spits and all, but you know what? We're all coming home to dad's house. Amen, amen. Be seated. Uh, I got to find a place to stop here, but I'm not stopping right now. When we pray, we pray in the, in the certainty, not without doubt, that our Father, our Daddy is hearing us, that He loves us deeply, and that He watches over us. Amen. Anybody ever have your dad step out onto something to save your bacon, your backside? Yeah. That's what dads do. He still does that. If you're going through something, I'm telling you, you find that place in prayer. Dad, I'll never forget. And it's a long road of learning for my son. Years and years ago, we had a fallen out. He was about 19 years old. And he was acting like a typical teenager. And uh, my mom and I were, were visiting. I went and got her, and she was hanging out at my house in Texas. And uh, we're just talking, man. We're, we're eating like kings. That's mom. I'm going to spoil it. You know, we were eating like kings, hanging out. And there's this timid little knock at the door. Almost like someone checking to see if no one's home so they can break in kind of knock. Y'all don't know nothing about that. So, man, my ears perk. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to. And Sister Erica knows you don't sneak in the house with me there. I'm sitting down in the living room the other day, and both my dog's ears perked up, and all of a sudden, I, I, I'm like, okay, what are, they, what are they going at? And I'm heading to, and the door just opens, and I'm like, I was fixing. Whoever's coming through that door was going to meet my buddy here. I didn't know what was going on. It was her. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. It was just perfect timing. The dogs got me all, someone's coming in. So the door starts, what do you mean the door's open? <laughs> so I, it got close. <laughs> you probably want to knock and let me open the door. Don't open the door. Sorry for you guys that come over during prayer and stuff. You might want to be careful. Because <laughs> we got people that just walk in. And I'm fine with it. I didn't mean for that to happen. But she was home early. But anyway. So anyway, my son, was that little knocking open, and there's my son. Now, he's already thin, but oh, my Lord. I just looked at him, and I could see he was defeated, and he was hungry. I didn't sit there and tell him about everything he did wrong and beat him up. I walked right into the kitchen, and I started making food. Acted like he'd never missed a beat. That's how God is. I don't know how many sandwiches he ate because we done ate the roast, but I had a bunch of bread, so he had a bunch of roast beef sandwiches, if I remember right, and just pie and all that kind of stuff. And whatever. He, he, 
And he ended up staying with dad. Never. You know, God doesn't want to beat you up. He does chastise you. Remember, did you learn your lesson yet? How many of us say, yeah, and then as soon as we get fed again, get some nice clothes, get a little money in the bank, we, we, we drift away. It's so funny. Some of us, I, I know God would love to bless you, but you drift. Anyway, let me wrap this up for tonight. The prayer that Jesus is teaching is an intimate kind of prayer. It is different from the formal or the very formal prayers of that we hear. The addition of the words in heaven tells of God's transcendence and the sovereign power. Listen, he can do things we can't. So it's best to make sure he's in the place we are and can never be. What a beautiful place the altar is. And so it identifies the almighty God, the omnipotent one who dwells in heavenly splendor and power and lets us know that he cares for us deeply. Aren't you glad the one that cares for us is in control of that? Praise God. The two terms, heavenly and father. Heavenly father. It balances God's greatness on the one side and the intimacy on the other. He is at the same time the ruler of all that is, the heavenly king of all kings, and our spirit man. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Abba, our daddy, as it were. Anybody ever as a kid brag that your dad can beat my dad can beat up your dad? Come on, some of y'all done that. Hello? Well, our daddy can beat up the daddy they got out there. The prodigal son left his father's house only to become a slave. And when he returned with the mindset to serve, he was restored to being a son. When we pray. When we pray, we create a balance between reverence and relationship. He is our Heavenly Father. Hallowed be thy name. Let's stand. I'll stop here tonight. I brag. I don't. Somebody else brags, and I heard them hear them brag. Nothing wrong with this. Nothing wrong with this story. I guess. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it is. This guy and his dad goes into the auto parts store to get something, and there's a conversation. And one of the guys across the counter said something to infer that the elderly gentleman was lying. Well, the son was standing there. The son reached over across that counter and grabbed that dude and pulled him up on the counter and gave him what for about how he spoke to his dad. In our humanity, we kind of gloat about that kind of. We brag about, well, wait, 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 wait. How can we then come in here and not be reverent of our Heavenly Father? How could we speak ill of him or his children. Something about us, we need to make sure his name is kept sacred. We need to, his house is kept clear of division. The first God-oriented petition is that the holiness of God's name would be magnified in every area of life. Philippians 2, 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Philippians goes on in the next verse that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven 
and things in earth and things under the earth. Historically, understand in the ancient world, a person's name was connected to the very essence of that person. God's name tells us who he is at the core of his being. Scripture plainly declares that holiness lies at the heart of God's character. So that first petition is that everything that the disciple does, listen to me, everything that we do, everything should make evident the holiness of God. We just don't come in here to act holy. Our conversation, our thought, we bring our thoughts into suggestion. He's, oh, oh, how can I walk in and darkeneth his counsel with my word? Who am I to walk in because I got five minutes into church and supersede the will, the plan, or God's holiness? It is our job. It is what we do that makes evident the holiness. God. It's how we carry ourselves. It's how we conduct ourselves. That's why in 1 Peter 1.16 it says because it is written be ye holy for I am holy. Aren't you glad he's, he's sovereign? Aren't you glad he's holy? 